Okay, so good morning slash afternoon again, everyone. My name is Emily Herzog. I'm an Epic Pathways Program Coordinator in the Office of Health Equity and Inclusion at the University of Michigan School of Nursing. Thank you again so much for being here. Um, we're excited to kick off our Winter 2024 Health Equity Leadership Series today. Um, our whole semester of speakers is now available for registration. If you um, are not already registered for any of our upcoming sessions, we encourage you to do so now. I'm multitasking like a pro and I'm putting it in the chat for those who are here with us live. Um, our next speaker will be, this used to seem forever away, now February 16th is less than a month away. Um, will be State Representative Jason Morgan, who represents the 23rd House District, which includes Ann Arbor and parts of Ann Arbor Townships. And he will be speaking about the housing, housing crisis in Washtenaw County and its intersection with health disparities in our community. He will also be shedding light on advocacy and enacting changes on um, healthcare workers, which I've heard from many students as a topic that you are um, interested in learning more about. So again, the link's in the chat if you can want to get registered. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Charlie Yingling. Dr. Yingling is the Associate Dean for Professional Practice and a clinical professor here at the University of Michigan School of Nursing. He is a national leader in community health with a particular focus on improving health outcomes for marginalized populations. We're so grateful, truly, genuinely, so, so grateful to have him joining us as our moderator today. Hello, Dr. Yingling. Hey, Emily, thanks so much for the kind introduction. Um, I have long dreamed that I would be invited to provide an introduction for the formidable for Shirley Stevenson. Uh, and however, now that the opportunity presents itself to me, I realize that I will invariably fall short. Shirley's contribution to nursing the arts and humanity at large cannot be adequately digested into this two to three minute introduction. So Shirley, my friend, I am sorry for what follows. Um, Shirley Stevenson is a family nurse practitioner whose experience has included emergency nursing, primary care, HIV prevention and treatment, and substance abuse. She served as the first NP medical director of a federally qualified health center located in a west side Chicago neighborhood with some of the highest rates of opioid use and overdose in the city. Shirley practices in the space where scientific evidence meets human interconnectedness. Presently, she is the poet in residence for the University of Illinois Chicago's Institute for Research and Addiction, Research on Addictions, I'm sorry. Uh, her poems and prose have been published in various literary journals, including the Michigan Quarterly Review, Fence, and Plowshares. Clinically, Shirley serves as the medical clinician and sub-investigator for a multi-site NIH clinical trial on cocaine use. She also serves as a co-coordinator for a postgraduate nurse practitioner fellowship that inter integrates substance use treatment and primary care with the aim of making advanced practice registered nurses more confident and competent addressing substance use disorder. Shirley's presentation comes during this week of observances and reflections on the life of Dr. King. Dr. King challenged us to adopt a new perspective on how we as humans could relate to one another. Through her work, Shirley Stevenson challenges, challenges us in a similar way to approach nursing and healthcare at large from a new perspective, one that does not divorce our science from our humanity, one that embraces the shared humanity between clinician and patient. I've known Shirley in a number of capacities, student, friend, colleague, nurse practitioner of myself and my family. But in all of those capacities, Shirley has been a kind and gentle teacher, guiding me to a richer understanding, the understanding that the empiricism of science is but one way of knowing that a lusher, more verdant way of knowing myself, my patients, and the world around me is possible through art, literature, and of course, poetry. To contextualize Shirley's presentation today, I wanna to share a quote, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna lose your screen share here, Emily, when I do this. This quote is from the, and I let me make sure I'm on the right one there, sorry. Um, this quote is from the opening of Audre Lorde's Sister Outsider uh, by Nancy K. Bar uh, Nancy K. Barriano wrote the introduction. And I think this does an excellent job of explaining why we are here today. But what about the conflict between poetry and theory, between their separate and seemingly incompatible spheres? We have been told that poetry expresses what we feel and theory states what we know, that the poet creates out of the heat of the moment while the theorist's mode is of necessity, cool and reasoned that one is art and therefore experienced subjectively, 
and the other is scholarship held accountable in the objective world of ideas. We have been told that poetry has a soul and theory has a mind and that we have to choose between them. The white Western patriarchal ordering of things requires that we believe there is an inherent conflict between what we feel and what we think, between poetry and theory. We are easier to control when one part of ourselves is split from another, fragmented off balance. There are other configurations, however, other ways of experiencing the world, though they are often difficult to name. We can sense them and seek their articulation. So Shirley, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we're delighted to hear from you today. Thank you. Thank you for that generous introduction, Dr. Yingling. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes, I was explaining before this started that it is like in Michigan, very cold here in Chicago. So um, I have space heater going behind me. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. Looking okay? Great. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thanks for being here, likely in the middle of a busy day for you. I'm delighted to be part of today's Health Equity Leadership Series. A special thanks to Emily Herzog and Charlie Yingling for the invitation and for all the coordination. It's a particular joy that this conversation about the humanities occurs within the MLK Symposium. I'm honored and humbled by this. So I'd like to begin with a reminder of the wisdom Martin Luther King gave the world. With this first quote, life's most persistent and urgent question, many of us gather today work in healthcare and education where there are ceaseless opportunities to do for others. To those of you who are studying to become nurses, a special thank you to you, we need you. All life is interrelated. We are certainly caught in that inescapable network of mutuality, a great word. In this sermon, MLK was speaking about interrelatedness in the context of global labor. I think most of us instinctively recognize interdependence. In healthcare, we see how our connections to others is indisputable. We see the impact of our interactions and interventions on patients, families, caregivers, and ourselves. Although we may sense that the human condition is one of interconnectedness, science happily confirms it. We are literally part of the universe and part of one another. Humans are composed of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and other elements, the same elements that make up stars. And as we know, our bodies also contain trillions of bacterial cells, not only the bacteria we battle, but those that live in harmony with our human cells. It's actually estimated that about half the cells that comprise our bodies are human cells, and the rest is just a microbiome of bacteria, fungi, viruses, and other forms of life. So in addition to the many ways our individual existences impact one another, Literally on the most fundamental level, we are all composed of the same chaos, squirm, and shimmer that makes up the universe itself. The late astronomer and writer Rebecca Elson observed this more eloquently in her poem, Antidote to Fear of Death. No outer space, just space, the light of all the not yet stars drifting like a bright mist and all of us and everything already there, but unconstrained by form. So let's pause for a moment and consider what we mean by the humanities. Depending on who you ask, you'll hear different definitions. I find this description from the National Humanities Center broad, but helpful. I've added italics to emphasize that the humanities can contain many realms of study, but really it's all about understanding humans. This, of course, does not happen in only one part of a campus or only in electives, museums, or fine arts centers. Ideally, this creative inquisitiveness permeates everything we do. It's part of why the University of Michigan Health has bedside music, art, 
and story programs. What about health humanities, sometimes called humanities in healthcare or medical humanities? This intersection, of course, is not new, but formal integration of the humanities into medical and nursing education is relatively novel. Programs have become increasingly common and popular in the last couple of decades. I see that U of M's nursing website states students will, quote, be prepared to integrate principles from the humanities with the natural, biological, and behavioral sciences. The trouble is, the realm of healthcare encompasses a lot, and so do the humanities. Put them together and we get very broad classifications that include bioethics, fine arts, literature, law, history, philosophy, religion, nursing, medicine, social work, performing arts, music. It can be hard to get one's arms around the health humanities. On a basic level, for my own practice, I think of health humanities as what information, be it results or diagnoses, means to the people involved, the patient, the loved one, and yes, the clinician. Rather than looking at what a data point, such as a white count, CT scan, pathology report, or cancer staging, tells us only about the disease, we consider what it means to the individual. We ask questions. Sometimes we never obtain an answer, and sometimes we realize we don't need one. That's where I'd like to dwell just for a moment with this excerpt from a poem by Mary Oliver. In snowy night, the speaker recalls a moment when she was standing outside listening to an owl hoot. She couldn't tell what type of owl it was, then decided it's okay not to define the owl or categorize its call. Oliver writes, but anyway, aren't there moments that are better than knowing something and sweeter? Snow was falling, so much like stars filling the dark trees that one could easily imagine its reason for being was nothing more than prettiness. I suppose if this were someone else's story, they would have insisted on knowing whatever is knowable, would have hurried over the fields to name it, the owl, I mean. But it's mine, this poem of the night, and I just stood there, listening and holding out my hands to the soft glitter falling through the air. I love this world but not for its answers. And I wish good luck to the owl, whatever its name, and I wish great welcome to the snow, whatever its severe and comfortless and beautiful meaning. I turn to this poem because it acknowledges that the world can be gorgeous and unyielding and harsh and sacred and most of all, unknowable all at the same time. Often, we must simply live with the questions. And then there are the things we most certainly do know, realities that are sometimes devastating and draining, knowledge that is difficult to put into words. The poet Marie Howe insists that art gives us a space for the ineffable and what often seems like the unendurable. People we love are going to die and we're going to die. It is unendurable. Art knows that, she says, art holds that knowledge. All art holds the knowledge that we're both living and dying at the same time. It can hold it. I believe this holding can be done by experiencing art or making it. And in my mind, art can be gardening, dancing, ceramics, singing, painting, or any of the activities that enable us to get quiet, lose track of time, and maybe lose track of ourselves. I'm leaning heavily today on poetry because that's where I find my equilibrium and solace. But we all have our own art. Some of us knit socks. Some of us make stained glass or dance. Another thing we know and witness on a daily basis is that we are laboring within unjust systems. Those of us working in healthcare typically chose the profession because we wanted to help in our own way or shape a new approach to helping. But unfortunately, even our best clinics and clinicians can't totally undo the consequences of inequity and intolerance, which of course impact health. So our efforts sometimes feel inadequate, which can cause moral distress. 
just as there are different types of injury, a bone fracture, a burn, a loss, there are different types of healing. I think these quotes from the poets Louise Glick and Yusef Komanyaka speak to the different types of pain we endure and see around us. As nurses, we are privileged to gain intimate knowledge of another. And if we're lucky to become trusted companions as someone strives for health or reconciles themselves to injury or illness, this is true for all people. Indisputably, along the way, we also witness and too often vicariously absorb a significant amount of suffering. Some of what we see in here may remind us of our own trauma or losses. We see at times physical agony, medical distrust, hopelessness. To state the obvious, the majority of people do not come to medical facilities when they are feeling their best. We see as nurses up close that severe and comfortless and beautiful world Mary Oliver referenced. We see and tend to what many people try to avoid. And we see the consequences of what Martin Luther King and so many others fought to change. Science does not always help us wade through this type of knowledge and experience. As humans, and certainly as nurses, we have to find a balance, not just that work-life balance, but sort of a human soul balance that will help us restore and continue in our vital work. The 13th century poet Rumi wrote this beautiful poem about how we must hover between life's holding and letting go. Your hand opens and closes and opens and closes. If it were always a fist or always stretched open, you would be paralyzed. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and expanding. The two is beautifully balanced and coordinated as bird wings. In the context of my own life, my own practice, I think of those wings as science and art. Together, they carry us. Academia sometimes uses the word consilience for these two fundamental realms of study, which certainly fits within that far-reaching health humanities field. There is evidence that the humanities serve us well. In studies, making music and pleasure reading reduced burnout among nursing students, and exposure to the humanities helped medical students tolerate ambiguity. The humanities correlate with characteristics that protect against burnout, and it's critical that we consider this as we see many healthcare workers leaving the field or contemplating departure. In research, neuroimaging shows that poetry elicits strong responses in the brain and listening to music can decrease blood pressure. Expressive writing improves coping skills and reduces stress. So how do we tap into our own creativity? The following formula is very helpful. Okay, you're right. Happily, there is no formula for creativity, but there are some suggestions. Again, much of this we all know instinctively. I'll remind us, have a full life. Will nurses live very full lives? We see the whole spectrum. Healthcare workers in general are creative souls. We respond to pain with the use of distraction, medication, repositioning, and psychosocial interventions. I won't read each of these, but I want to stress the value of exploring conflict because constraint and tension are often sources of creativity. And in exploring those I wish statements, for example, I wish there was an easier way to get this done. Stop, consider what it might be. Attunement to our own creativity can help us reimagine healthcare systems and our roles within them. The world of medicine often perpetuates exclusion and inequity. Creativity can help change things. I'm gonna share an example from Chicago. There's a recovery center that opened a food pantry on Chicago's west side. They were offered guidance by other organizations in our city that run food pantries about how very challenging it is to sort out how many people are trying to come more than once a week because many people don't have their government IDs. So this recovery center's new food pantry decided two things. 
one. They would not limit how many times people could come each week. If someone says they need food, they can come as often as they want. And two, if a lot of people don't have an ID, which of course is needed to obtain so many services, the pantry would simply staff someone to help them obtain it. What the food pantry found is that many of the clients were females raising children on their own. So the organization rented an empty space next door, invited the women to design it how they wanted, and created a place for women's support groups. Many of the women talked about the impact of addiction on their families and communities. So the food pantry then began an on-site harm reduction program that included a needle exchange and access to medications for opioid use disorders. This organization came at everything from a different angle. Let's consider creativity in approach. In an interview, the poet, playwright, essayist, and editor, Claudia Rankin, said she spends a lot of time considering the question, how can I say this so that we can stay in the car together and yet explore the things that I want to explore with you? Rankin was speaking in the context of conversations about race, but it's a great consideration in any setting, including how we deliver and receive information in healthcare. Again, think of those power structures. Often we are standing and the patient is lying in a hospital bed or sitting in a gown. We sometimes use medical language that is definitely exclusionary. There is a hierarchy in healthcare that perpetuates imbalance. How can I say this so that we can stay in this car together, meaning this same boat, meaning this existence together? How can I listen differently? How can I hear you yet acknowledge we do not live one another's realities? A lot of othering happens in healthcare. Part of it is necessary. If we identify too strongly with a patient, we may become too emotionally involved or not think clearly in an emergency. If we allow ourselves to feel, we might not be able to hold it together, which of course is also part of our job. Making things objective can make them easier to handle, but that distance from patients can contribute to the idea that what's happening to them can't happen to us, which of course is not the case. Today, we may help heal, but on another day, we too may suffer. Recognizing this can be <clears throat> help us be present in our practice. This humanity is not antithetical to the rest of our work. The algorithms, procedures, screens, and documentation that can be so dehumanizing. Sometimes reading a short story, listening to music, or looking at an image can remind us of this in a different and necessary way. We can step out of our clinical shoes and remember that we are all fellow writers on the journey. In Taking Turns, Stories from HIV AIDS Care Unit 371, the nurse and graphic memoirist M.K. Zerwick describes how art became a bridge for her, a place of reconciliation. As with most nursing jobs, night shifts on her unit never went as planned. On one particular evening, everything seemed to go wrong. MK was exhausted, but when her shift ended and she was heading out, a patient made an unexpected request. He was afraid and wanted to be held. So MK sat on the bed and held the patient until he felt less scared. Then she headed home, changed by the encounter and unsure what to do with her feelings. At home, she began painting, and as she did so, she realized that this act of creation was her way of integrating the starkly different truths of her world, work world, and her personal world. For MK, and for many people, including myself, art is both an outlet and an integration of realities. I included this because I think this illustration is one of the best I've ever seen. Not only about making us better clinicians or better nurses, but making us better people healthier for ourselves and able to go on. Poetry works for me because it allows me to focus on individual words and to slow things down. 
maybe because I worked in the ER or because so much of primary care is built around the 15 minute structure, which of course never feels like enough time. I like to think about line breaks and sejura, which are pauses in poetry where we take a breath. I can reconsider and maybe even reconstruct moments, then look at them from other perspectives. In poetry, there is a rhythm that can be musical or meditative. Some people hear that as they're writing like a chant or a prayer. In contemporary poetry, few people adhere to meter when they're writing these days, but there's rhythm in all language. One of the most basic patterns in poetry is the I am, which is just one unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. In marking out these metrical units, the unstressed syllable is denoted by the U and the slash indicates the stress. We can see the little I am's in the first two lines of this Wordsworth poem, I wandered lonely as a cloud. Does this make you think of any other rhythms? Yes the most essential rhythm of all. Creative experiences and outlets can also be placeholders for things that have nowhere else to go. As humans, and again, as healthcare workers, we may witness things that we cannot share with loved ones, maybe because it feels too private or sacred or shattering. And because we want to spare our friends and loved ones the knowledge that certain kinds of hurt exist and could someday affect each of us. Today, we are the caregiver. One day, we will be the patient. Not everyone can face that fact. Nurses come to know this. Where do we put that wisdom? The poet Diane de Prima describes this type of protective withholding as a kindness we all must extend to one another. I don't always write about my work in healthcare, but when I do, it's because rather than avoiding, I need to concentrate on something and consider it from different angles. When I first began writing poems about my work as a nurse, I wrote objectively with a distance as one might write in a medical chart, as in this poem, Practice. It was very sparse writing, even as it became more metaphorical. Toward the end, I write, we hold their skulls until our arms quiver and their faces bead. They arrive in rain without shoes. Some break into song and some can't breathe. Lips clamped bluish over tight hinged throats. We count the rise and fall. We lay the fields and reach around them. We run before the little weight goes limp. The gun bumps marrow. We hold the note. We hold the strings taut. It was hard for me to write about my work in the hospital. I don't know why I'd had a writing life and then a, a nursing life. So short sentences, there's a we, there's a them. Over time, I began allowing myself to explore my own reactions in the writing, as in this poem, Family Room which is about a night, a snowy night, when I was looking at my healthy family, but recalling something devastating that had happened in the workday. When I wrote this poem, we had a wonderful Australian shepherd who would howl whenever ambulance passed, ambulances passed the house. So we would all join in the howling. Our kids were young at that point, and it was sweet and funny. But that night, the joy of the moment in contrast to what had happened at work was also painful. So in this moment, I'm looking at my children and thinking, I want to see them not in contrast to those siblings I led from the trauma bay to the family room this morning. Each witness had a different version, how the child was dragged through the jagged sun, how the snowbanks and ice made it impossible. Jane, my daughter, points at me delighted. You howled so hard you cried, she says and flings her arms around me. In 1954, James Elam proved exhaled breath could maintain oxygenation. I can't say how the mother begged us to try again or held my hand against her chest as she rocked, as if my hand were the broken thing, as if I were the one.
One means of expression is certainly not better than another, but I think that in this second poem, I was more truthful with myself and less self-conscious about the fact that I am affected by the lives around me, even when wearing scrubs. The ability to carry on with this blurriness or uncertainty is a key feature of the humanities. And I'd like to conclude by stressing its value. In the 20th century, the poet Mark Doty asserted, the questions are more trustworthy than answers, which recalls a term coined by the early 19th century poet, John Keats. Negative capability refers to one's ability to tolerate pain and confusion of not knowing rather than imposing ready-made certainties. Acknowledging that we do not have all the answers inspires humility and humility helps open us to new information and ways of seeing the world. At the heart of creativity is a different way of observing and understanding. So often in healthcare, we can only rule things out but not determine an answer or a cause. We can only conclude that symptoms have an unknown origin. Sitting with uncertainty can be lonely and certainly scary, but it also keeps us striving and searching, which is in itself an act of hope. Thank you for allowing me to spend a little time with you today.